Cheers, and welcome to Chicago Reacts. My name is Lauren, and today I am going to be looking at how to drink. Uh, specifically, I will be looking at what is wine. Uh, today, for those of you who don't know, I'm recording this on May 25th. That's not important, but what's important is that May 25th in America is National Wine Day. So I've got my wine right here. This is just a sparkling red um, that I got from my Wine of the Month Club that I'm in. It's all right. It's a little tart, a little citrusy, weirdly acidic, but not terrible. I kind of like it. Um, and I'm curious to see what uh, I'm going to learn about wine in this video. I hope you're excited to learn as well. Um, and definitely keep me appraised of what your favorite wines are in the comments below. I'm going to try and I would like to try some of them out. But without any further ado, let's learn something. Today, I am finally learning some things about wine. Let's do that right now on HTD. I'm really sticking with that. I'm going to make that work. It's going to happen. I don't know about that. As I've said on the show a few times, mainly when talking about frequent HED sponsor Bright Cellars, I know a lot less about wine than I should, and they thought we should fix that, so they decided to sponsor this episode in which I, and you two, will learn some basics about wine, mainly the core styles of wine, where they're from, what's in them, and maybe, if my palate is refined enough, what they taste like. Though, honestly, tasting wine and tasting cocktails aren't exactly the same thing, and I'm not sure how many subtleties I'm gonna be able to pick out here, but I shall do my best. And hey though, maybe that kind of like lay approach to this whole thing is actually of more use to you than the sommeliers insights, assuming you've got a lay palate too, much like me. So no, for me, like I went to a, a vineyard a couple, like like a week ago, um, and like, you know, they have the sommelier, like tell, like, you know, uh, she had everything like written out and it's like, occasionally if I look at the, what they say I'm going to taste, I can pick out one or two of those. Like, I'm like, okay, well, yeah, I get the citrusiness or it's like, okay, well, I get those chocolate undertones. But like, other than that, I'm just like, I don't know if tastes of wine and either it's a taste of wine I like, or it is a taste of wine. I don't. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I don't know. I, my, my criteria is fairly dry is the way to go for me, but not like super tannin heavy. Um, like I like that middle ground <laughs> and not buttery. Like get those buttery Chardonnays away from me. I don't know. Lay. Anyway, I've got to throw a big thanks out to Bright Cellars for helping me make this one possible and providing the wines for this. So thank you, Bright Cellars. In case you haven't heard me talk about it yet, Bright Cellars is pretty awesome. They select and ship wines to you based on your answers to a very short, very simple quiz on their website. Somehow they've distilled the process of finding out what kind of wines you're most likely to enjoy down to just these seven questions. I've really enjoyed the wines I've received from Bright Cellars, and through refining my selections with them over time, I've come to see that I'm something of a Pinot Noir man, like a Malbec and a Rioja, too. Whatever your interest or experience with wine is, Bright Cellars is a great way to try new wines you haven't before and expose your taste buds to new stuff. After they ship some wine straight to you, you taste it and then rate it, and they use that feedback to really dial in the perfect bottles just for your taste. Right now, I feel like I've used Bright Cellars. I'm going to ignore his ad for a second. I feel like I've used them before. I, I think it was this, this particular wine service that I've used. I liked it, um, but then... And I would have kept going with the service, honestly, but my card got hacked. And so, like, everything that I'd originally had on that card, all of my, like, outgoing um, monthly payments, like, all of them got uh, canceled. And then uh, there was just a lot of them that couldn't be bothered to, <laughs> to put back. Uh, Bright Sellers then is one of the ones that, uh, that got cut by the wayside. But, hey, if they want to sponsor me, I would absolutely order from them again. Now Bright Sellers is giving HED fans an exclusive deal. Half off your first six bottle box and a bonus bottle on top of that. So seven bottles and all you've got to do Ooh. is click the link below, take the quiz and get started. So this was a long a time try. ago. I can't all do right. it. Let's learn about some wine. I guess the first question to answer is what is wine? Where does it come from? Let's just get the basics out of the way. You may already know this, but if you hadn't heard it before, wine, it's fermented grapes. From place to place, the methods and techniques used to get that grape juice exposed to some yeast under the right conditions for it to turn into wine that you actually want to drink will vary quite a bit. But at the end of the day, that's what it is. It's fermented grape juice. Secondly, wine, very broadly speaking, is incredibly old. It's older than writing old, which makes it technically prehistoric. And so it's kind of a pointless endeavor 
to even consider attempting to pin down the first human-like creature to accidentally make wine. I think that was a plot line of the remake of Land of the Lost. Have you been drinking something? I remember there was an episode with some wine fruit that I enjoyed when I was a kid. I liked that. Very, very special fruit! That was the Land of the Lost's anti-drug episode. Like, no, don't don't eat the, the rot fruit. How could they get drunk off the of fruit? Oh, it fermented. The fruit juice turns into alcohol. The Land of the Lost. I like that show. I don't know why. Oh, I know why. Yeah, I remember why I like that show. That does make sense. I stink. And as far as we think, that's exactly what happened. Probably sometime well over 10,000 years ago, somebody was collecting grapes to eat for later, stored them somewhere, and then found a few days later that, hey, the grapes at the bottom, they tasted a bit different now and also made things more fun. Cheers! Cheers. <laughs> and that kind of spontaneous fermentation probably happened anywhere people and grapes were in the same area. And also any kind of berries, by the way, too. They'll just kind of wine up on their own just uh, fine off the yeast in the air. Although it wouldn't be wine, it would be something else because wine, vine, vin de, it, the, wine is grapes. But yeah, you can make some berry booze, berry booze, gummy berry juice. Bottoms up! Out of whatever you find, you just leave it out. Um, yeast is everywhere. As a matter of fact, Welch's grape juice, this is an aside, was the painstaking creation of a guy who really hated alcohol uh, and was desperate to find a way to make grape juice that wouldn't turn into wine because you you juice these things the yeast is in the air they turn into wine it just happens right it might not be good wine if you want it to be good wine it takes some work and that's the kind of stuff we're going to drink today we mostly pinned the domestication of grapes somewhere to eight or ten thousand years ago with the earliest physical evidence we have of people intentionally fermenting those grapes into an alcoholic beverage at around seven thousand years ago in china Georgia, Iran, Greece, and Sicily are also homes to some yep. very ancient archaeological winemaking sites. Run I work at a place that we have a lot of Georgian wines. Um, and if he's going to like explain about it, I'll let him. But if he's not, I'll explain about it a little bit more. I really, really like a Georgian wine, though. And they have been making it the same way for thousands of years. So like the wines that we have in our bar are almost identical to what they made thousands of years ago. I mean, the bottling process is different because now we use glass bottles to bottle them, but they still ferment the grapes in the clay pots, um, at least with the ambers specifically. And that's what gives a Georgian amber wine the color that it has. Um, and also it gives it like a sort of a more uh, mineral taste a lot of the time because the clay in the, in the jars kind of siphons off a little bit into the wine itself. So if he's going to explain about that, I will let him, but I will say a Georgian wine is really, really good. Um, it's also really different. We have people asking a lot of the time, is it like a Sauv Blanc? Is it like a Chardonnay? And the answer is no, <laughs> it's really, really not. Um, like I had one customer one time kind of ex explain it sort of as a middle ground between like a citrusy beer and wine um and that's that's kind of close uh to some of the flavor profiles that you get with a lot of the ambers out there um and like and like it's interesting so like it just doesn't it, you have to go into drinking it knowing it's not what you expect um and i i like them um uh, obviously a lot of people like them it's a but it's a it's a good thing to try out at some point, but just know that it's not going to be what you think it is. Running from between 5,000 to 6,000 years ago. The most ancient industrial scale winery we found dates to 4,000 years ago in Greece. Uh, it was complete with wine press and fermentation vats and the works. And that's just what we found. Archaeologists presume that the presence of this single highly developed winery indicates that it was already a very well-developed technology that was in use in various places around the ancient world. Certainly by the time we're looking at ancient Rome, this is a culture that really valued its wine, there's a pretty large number of styles and types and qualities of wines, and we see that in the writings of ancient Romans, that some years and such and such vintage were more valued than others. And that is about as far as I think I can go on the history of winemaking, particularly in the ancient world, without this episode turning into something else entirely. Fair so enough. I am glad that I did a little tangent on my Georgian wines, though, because he didn't really discuss it very much. But like I said, it's a it's an interesting process wherein they ferment the uh, wine in clay pots, um, and that gives it uh, an interesting um, 
like an interesting flavor. Also, sometimes you get a little bit of sediment in there, um, which is, again, fine. Um, and you get that with other other wines, too. It's not just Georgian, uh, like the clay pot ambers. Um, but it is some of the one of the things that sometimes you get to the bottom of a bottle and people are like, what is this? And I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> it's all right. It's just because of how they make it. Um, also, because of the way that they make the wine, um, George, like all wine, you should probably drink fairly quickly. Um, but some are fine for like a week or a week and a half, you know, after you've opened it and they're not going to change too much. Georgian wines, you have to drink within like two days um, to get make sure you're actually getting a really good uh profile out of that and like otherwise it, it, they go funky kind of quick so once you open them you have to kind of drink them pretty quickly um mostly because it's still a very organic process and they don't put any preservatives or anything into those wines anyway that is my that is my wine tangent i'm going to be looking and i'll let him let him uh explain the rest so now i'm gonna move on to looking at these examples of 11 primary modern types 11? of wine. And I should say, I tried to cover a sort of basic gamut of the common wines you're gonna find out there, but certainly this list is really far from exhaustive. This is meant to be a basics of the basics primer for the both of us, because I am hardly an ex expert on this subject. And a lot of this, a lot of this, like all of this is very new to me too. Let's start with red, red wines, makes me feel fine. So red wines are made from dark grapes, and these are not like the red table grapes that you buy at the grocery store to eat, um, but these are like blackish purple grapes. The juice of these grapes is still clear though. Color uh, in red wine comes from the skins, which they ferment up right along with the juice together in something they call the must. The skins of the dark grapes, the black grapes, they have a lot of tannins in them, and since they take those skins, with the juice and combine them into a must that's fermented to make red wine, those tannins are in the wine. You have a lot of tannins in red wines. Tannins are bitter chemicals that can kind of suck the moisture out of your mouth. Same as like in super oversteeped tea. Uh, it's a huge part of the defining the tastes of a red wine. A lot of red wines spend some time on oak to age them, take the edge off of some of those tannins, right? Also, you may be aware that some wines are very old and that very old, highly aged wines are good and desirable, but that will only really apply to red wine. Red wines age well because tannins are a preservative. All right, uh, let's get started with the reds. First up is Pinot Noir, and much like I can't reference red wine without saying red, red wine, I can't reference Pinot Noir. Is he gonna sing? Is he gonna do the, uh, the Kimmy Schmidt thing? I do that every single time. I like hear Pinot Noir, Titus, in my brain. It was Pinot Noir every single time. I can't unhear it. It's just there in my head. Without saying Pinot Noir. By the way, we're going to go through these in absolutely no particular yes. order. It's just the order I picked at Good. random. So anyway, although Pinot Noir is a very specific variety of grape, as far as my research indicates, a bottle of a Pinot Noir wine doesn't need to be 100% Pinot Noir grapes, but it does need to be mostly Pinot Noir. These grapes like cooler climates and are primarily grown in the Burgundy region of France, which is not coincidentally where you'll find most of the Pinot Noir being made, though Pinot Noir is being produced all over the world. Now I'm told to expect a Pinot Noir to be dry, light, acidic, and not heavy with tannins, and with a soft mouthfeel. This one is called Humdrum, and let's see how it is. Here we go. Let's try some Pinot Noir. All right. That's one of the things I like about a Pinot Noir too. It's like because they do tend to be like sort of softer um, and like they're not as like tannin heavy as some of the others. It's easier to drink more of it. Um, other other reds have like a much heavier like they're a lot more tannin and it's just they're just harder to drink um, more than a single glass that you sip for hours. So if you're like on a long dinner or something and you want to drink but not get super drunk, then like a different, like a Malbec maybe would be good. But like a Pinot Noir is like a great, you're just chilling with friends and you want to like crush a bottle really easily. Pinot Noir is usually a good one for that. All right, so humdrum, here we go. I get like unsweetened cherries, like a dry cherry kind of thing there. Big time, big time. With like um, a kind of tart, bitter finish. Maybe slightly metallic, but like I think that's just like the way the tart and the bitter is resolving there. I like that. That's good. That's a good wine. There's some butter, buttery, buttery kind of parts there too. Yeah, I get some butter. 
in the in that mix there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I do get like, you know, a mild dose of tannins, like the that slurping, drying of your mouth factor. Yeah, I get a little of that. I like that. That's a good one. Let's move right on down my list here. All right, I do want to check. I just want to check him because I think I might be able to check his work there. So if I look up the humdrum Pinot Noir, I'll be able to tell um, like what some of his flavors are. Oh, okay, they're calling this a Naomi. Yeah, it's a 21. That's not it. I would like to look it up, but I can't. Oh, there it is. Pinot Noir, Humdrum Wines. I just want to see if I can find it, figure out, just for this one at least, if he's if he's correct. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Pinot Noir shows a balanced acidity with a medium light body and ripe red fruit, fruit flavors of strawberry, raspberry, and cherry. St uh, touches of baking spices and earth in the finish. So, I mean, he got cherry and he got mineral. So that's... He was right. All right. So I just wanted to check his work real quick. Um, I will not be doing that for the others. I just wanted to see. And look at Zinfandel. Now, if you're like me, you might be thinking of white Zinfandel because you heard it on a TV commercial while growing up. Hey, Mike, I really like this white Zinfandel. Well, good, good. Now put it down. We're going to try another one. <laughs> but this isn't a white Zinfandel. This is just plain old Zinfandel, which is a, like a dark grape that produces a red wine. In Italy, by the way, these grapes and the wine that they produce are called Primotivo. I can't decide right now if I just like really nailed the Italian pronunciation on that or if I bungled it disastrously. I'm not going back to find out. You guys I feel like he said it right. Primitivo. I feel like he said it all right. You guys can let me know if I did that right. And again though, the Zinfandels, even though this is a very Italian type thing, it is a, it's a variety of grape. It's not a regional appellation. So they're being produced all over the world, right? They're just closely associated with Southern Italy. The variety of grape itself originated in Northern Italy, Croatia region. Um, and I'm told I should expect a Zinfandel to have a lot of fruit, baking spice notes, and a decent bit of hang time on the evolution here. So let's give this bottle of Meat Cute a try. Well, it it's does. red. It's the first thing I can tell you about it. it. Sure is. Now, I get that. That To me, that's a lot more sweet than the humdrum. That's definitely sweeter. And I guess more plummy than cherry. -y. I do get some baking spice, though. I get, like, um, nutmeg, allspice... Kind of like sort of what you'd get in like a carrot cake or banana bread, but with much less sweetness, but like that kind of spiciness. And there's a bit of tang. It's like a, there is a bite there all the way through that is, I'm not sure if it's the spiciness or like the bitterness of the tannins. Again, I like it actually quite a bit. This is a California Zinfandel. Let's move right along to Syrah. And I want to pronounce that as Syrah, but I, actually the pronunciation guide says it's pronounced Syrah. I also seem to recall Hannibal Lecter in one of those movies complaining about uh, Australians pronouncing it Shiraz. So I don't know what the correct or most incorrect pronunciation was. I've definitely always thought it was Shiraz. Like. I think they just needed to get a wine pronunciation joke into that movie. I think that was the one where he ate some guy's brain with a spoon. So the Syrah uh, grape is, again, this is a specific type of grape. Uh, these are highly cultivated in the Rhone Valley of France uh, and also Australia because why not? But also because this is a grape and not a regional appellation. They are being produced all over the place. Syrah grapes, though, they show up in red wine blends a lot. What I've read on Syrah... I usually do think of a Syrah, Syrah, I guess is how you say it. I usually think of that as a Australian wine. I feel like I've just seen more Australian uh, varietals of, of a Syrah. 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 What I've read on Syrah tells me that where a particular Syrah grape was grown is going to have a huge effect on its flavor. Uh, maybe more so than other grape varieties. So one Syrah to the next might be quite different. However, I'm also told that I should expect a Syrah to be packed with an intense, concentrated, fruity wallop of punchy, punchy fruit flavors, black peppercorn, salt, tobacco, and a fair amount of tanniny bitterness. So let's sample this. Where is the one I'm looking for here? I'm looking for Nihilist. I'm looking for some Nihilist Syrah. The Nihilist Slabowski! Oh man, we're just gonna have like, we're gonna have one for every one, where each one's gonna have some kind of a Nice reference. Nihilist Wine Company. This is a California Petit Sera. Whew, that's dark. That's the darkest red one yet. So here we go with uh, this Nihilist Petit Sera. Maybe that's why they call it Nihilist. Maybe it's darkness. You look into it, like, we look into the Petit Sera and we see the abyss which uh, echoes within the confines of our soul. I don't know, something like that. Okay, here we go. The Petit Sera. 
I was gonna say the other ones had more fruity, citrusy. No, not citrusy. The other ones had more fruity noses. This one has a kind of a funky nose. You know what? I should smell it less and drink it more. I would say it's tart and bitter, but it's specific, and I'm having a hard time placing it. It's kind of herbal. That's kind of what I would say that is. If I was comparing that to like, I'm thinking about like the tasting note I would give this if it was a cocktail. I think they're just like very different profiles that I'm used to having to pick apart, right? Like, I'm not skilled at this at all. There's a, maybe it's cedar. Maybe that's what I would say that is. It's kind of like cedar, cedarsy. Personally, I don't get a lot of evolution on this one. I just kind of get that and it's dry. Dry like in that it's not sweet, but not dry in that like it's tanniny and sucking the moisture out of my mouth. There it is, nihilist wine. All right, let's get on to some Cabernet Sauvignon. Hey, I do like a Cab Sav. I really hope he doesn't stare directly into my soul as he drinks this one. I didn't like that very much. This is the most popular wine in the world, actually, and the grapes are heavily planted in the Bordeaux region of France. I mean, it's good. Cherry and currant and baking spices are to be expected, so I'm told, and woodsy, oaky flavors. Big tannins here, they call it a full-bodied wine. Okay, most popular wine style in the world. Cabernet Sauvignon, this one is called Obscura. Okay, uh, it's a ca California one. Not quite as dark black red as the Nihilist wine. I like that a lot. Yes, For me, that's really light and fruity. It's not overly acidic or overly bitter or like overly that? tanniny. It just tastes honestly kind of fresh, to be honest. I really like that. This is something that like, I'm never gonna object to this being in my glass, honestly. It's just very easy for me to drink. That's probably why it's the most popular wine in the world. It's It must be a flavor profile that's just really is approachable for a huge segment of the population and kind of whenever, you know, you don't have to be in a mood for it. Yeah, love it, really good. I would it's say great. that's pretty true for like a good Cab Sav. I mean, there's some that are just terrible and there's some that are like are way funky. Um, and there's a couple, like sometimes um, like you can get them with a little bit too much of like a tobacco edge to it. But some of that, you know, depends on where it's from. Some of it depends on, you know, the year or whatever, as is true with every wine, obviously. Um, but no, like a Cab Sab, like a Cab Sab is usually pretty unobjectionable. Um, and it goes with a lot of different food too, which is also good. Um, so like, uh, the Cab Sab is the only one at the restaurant I work at that we have two of that type of wine. Um, so we have two different Cab Sabs. We have one from Serbia and we have one from California. Um, they're both fairly popular. They both sell. Um, but like all of the other wines that we have, it's like, you know, we've got one, um, we used to have two Pinot Noirs as well, but now we only have one. Uh, you know, we've got like one Malbec, we have one like Merlot blend, we have one, uh, Sauv Blanc, you know, it's like, we just have one of everything else. Um, other than the like specific Georgian wines, we have like four Ambers, you know, and then we have like three different types of Rosé, but that's why I'm like. I just count it as they're all, they're different. But Cab Sav, again, it's popular. You need multiple types because they're a little different. And, you know, some people want something a little lighter. And it's interesting. Anyway, sorry. Next, Moan. Bring me Moan. I should have had like, a, oh God, I should have done this at a toga. We really screwed up, man. And that brings me to Bordeaux. Now, Bordeaux is a regional appellation. And I think this is the first regional appellation we've hit into with the red wines. Um, is named for the Bordeaux region of France. This is a blended wine. It's going to predominantly feature the Cabernet Sauvignon that we just had, but also Merlot. Uh, can also include Malbec and Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot and others to get to the desired flavor profile. The winemaker, so long as it's being made in the Bordeaux region of France. Otherwise, it's just, it's got a different kind of name. Uh, they, they make Bordeaux style wines elsewhere. Uh, they have to call it a different name. I forget what they call it. I'll put it up on screen here. I want to say it's meningitis, but I know that's not it. It's just, it's, I mean, obviously it's not that, but those are the letters just in a different order or something. And I should say that I am simplifying here a ton because the Bordeaux region of France is not just Bordeaux wine. The Bordeaux region of France actually has 54 appellations of wine, some of which are red, some are white, some are sweet, some are dry, some are cheap, some are phenomenally unattainably expensive. We're talking about Bordeaux, which is also this overall protected appellation, a red blend that I am describing here. I am told to expect big flavors, uh, currant, plum, they're gonna be dry, supposedly, a lot of tannins. Yeah, I mean, it's a real one. This is an appellation Bordeaux Superior Contrôle. 
Thank you, France, for allowing me to mangle your words so badly. It's very refined, very dry. Oh, he's not staring into really my soul dry. this time. Okay. A big flavor better. component of a fruit is its sweetness. And when you take that sweetness away, it's sometimes it's hard to identify it as the fruit, right? So they say that I should find current plum, certain kinds of stone fruit here. But this particular Bordeaux is very dry, devoid of any sweetness, I would say. It's not bitter, it's not unpleasing, it's just not sweet. And I, I'm enjoying it a lot, actually. It's really good to do that. To be really well balanced without sugar is a feat in itself. Um, and I would say it is really well balanced. It's totally drinkable and enjoyable wine. It doesn't like, it's not bracing or, you know, aggressive or anything like that. I want to find those fruit in here. I want to find them. Even though, you know, they're going to be hard for me because there's no sugar. Well, I'm not going to lie. It's beyond me. I can't find any fruit in there. You defeated Maybe my wine. wine. Actually, which is a weird thing for a red wine to have. But I mean... There's a bit of bitterness there, and if I wanted to compare it to fruit, I would say it's kind of like a lime peel. Kind of, but not really. A little woodsy, a little bit woodsy, a little oaky. Maybe, maybe? I don't know. I'm not really good at pulling this one apart. It's well done. Totally drinkable, very enjoyable, but just dry, approachable, bitter wine. All right, now let's- He is explaining the wines a lot the way that I do at various, you know, when people ask me. <laughs> Like, what is it like? I'm like, and then you just pull nonsense words out of uh, a hat until you have like, what could be considered a reasonable wine profile. And um, I have literally never once been called out on it. And I have in fact been described on the internet as having a good knowledge of the wine. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'm just that good. But also it's just like, Unless you're like looking, you're sitting like with a sommelier or somebody who is just like, or a winemaker, you know, um, but it doesn't matter. Like I've, I've no one person whose family makes wine. Um, he, he, his family actually makes wine in Georgia. So it's like, but he has like a pretty solid grasp of like pulling out flavors and like, uh, breaking wine down like that because he's been doing it his entire life so it's like very rarely you'll find you'll like run into one of these people in the wild but mostly it, you can just kind of make stuff up oh yeah it's dry um you know it's it's got a little bit of an oak sort of uh like palette to it it's just it's very full-bodied it's a real full-bodied red um it, but it's not like suck your moisture out of your mouth tanniny like you know it's like just you can, it's, it's not that difficult to come up with, uh, like, and honestly, the things that you need to hit on are dry and full bodied. Like those are like the two, like most important words I've found, uh, especially when describing a red. It's like, oh no, yeah, it's dry. It's our, our, well, our driest, most full bodied wine is the Saparavi. It's the most popular one we've got. And like, you know, just, just kind of like, just drop a couple of keywords in there and people believe you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Let's talk Chianti, or Chianti, if you prefer. I sadly have no fava beans or human liver to pair this with, so please forgive me this horrible dad joke. I was obligated to make it. Chianti is a protected regional appellation of Italy, so it's our second protected regional appellation of red wines. Um, it is mostly going to be comprised of Sangiovese grapes, but it's a blend and can have small amounts of other varieties as a component as well. Chianti is also associated with a bottle called a Fiasco, which is a kind of squat thing Ooh. wrapped in a basket. And I That's love cool. Fiascos. I love that it's called a Fiasco. I love the way that they look. I love the way that wax melts on them. I love that the way that the, the pirate with the hair on his legs that's growing, when you go under him on Pirates of the Caribbean, he's drinking from one. I like a Fiasco. I like saying the word Fiasco. It's a fun word. As I slowly turn into Regis Feldman, Chiantis are associated with tar- I do love the sass of the uh, the words that come up on the screen. <laughs> that always that always tickles. Heart flavors, acidity. They're very floral sometimes, and they are supposed to be packed with tannins. Packed with tannins. Sadly, this is an irregular bottle and not a fiasco. I regret this. I guess the fiasco is going out of style. Unfortunately, I think that they're awesome. I just want them. I like them. Kind Here of we go. Um, Chianti. Stop looking into my soul when he drinks. Tart, citrusy, 
kind of it pinches at the back of your throat almost. Definitely acidic. Um, and I guess that's a deciding factor for Chianti's, which is interesting because growing up, I thought someone had told me that Chianti's were very sweet. I don't know where I got that from. I mean, they can be, but there's, they're not typically. They are typically the, it's, it's a pretty, um, it's acidic, yeah. Tart. I like it. I get cherry. I can never tell though, is that like psychosomatic? It's red and it's tart, therefore it tastes like cherries. I don't know. And it tastes like red. Maybe a little vanilla. Maybe there's been a little, maybe that one's a little aged. Maybe that one did some oak time. I don't know. And now finally, we depart France and Italy and head to Spain to look at Rioja wine. Rioja is another regional type of wine named for La Rioja province in northeastern Spain. There are white Riojas, but the red is far more common as far as I know. And the red, by the way, is primarily going to be made from Tempranillo grapes, though other grapes do get into the mix. Riojas are frequently well aged. It's sort of a defining characteristic of Riojas. Um, and they have a reputation actually as being some of the best wines for the money. The flavors of Rioja wine are said to often include black raspberries, cherries, dark fruits, berries, blackberry. Um, this is a medium acidic wine and medium tannins, but also the effects of spending a lot of time on oak can be uh, vanilla spice, uh, vanilla and spices and smoke and that kind of thing, right? And technically the bottle I have here is not a Rioja. My bad. This is actually a Tempranillo dominant blend from Spain, so it should be in that ballpark. I hope so. Let's give it a try. Um, we're doing our best here. Well, I like it first off. Yeah. It has a bright and clear flavor. It kind of reminds me of Applejack. So maybe that's what that is, is it orchard fruit. Like I'm getting, getting apples or plums there dried way out, um, like that dry, thin apple flavor that you get from an Applejack, that wisp of appleiness. And maybe there is actually some kind of an allspice cinnamon baking thing at the very end there. It's a lingering wine that hangs out for a minute. Bright and clear orchard into baking. And pretty dry too, not very, this is not a sweet wine at all. Um, I like that. All right, well that wraps up red wines, so it's time to move on to white wines. So white wines are made from green grapes, but a big part in the process of producing a white wine is to remove the skins of the grapes entirely and throw them away. They don't go into the must. And I don't think they really throw them away. I think they land in a big vat that they call grappas, and then they make very high proof rocket fuel out of them. But um, red wines are much more likely to be aged in oak, whereas white wines are very likely, or more likely, to be mellowed on stainless steel. It's not really the same thing as aging on oak, but also, it's also not totally inert because it's not spirit, it's a fermented thing. So there are changes that happen, but it's not the same as being on oak, right? It doesn't have the same effects as oak and something. It does, it keeps them fresher, more aromatic. Uh, white wines don't have any of the tannins of red wines, and that's a big reason why they tend to be much lighter, much more acidic, though specifically not bitter than reds. So let's try some. So it's also one of the reasons that I like a white better in warmer months too. Like winter is for red wine it's for whiskey you know like that's that lives in winter time um or and dark rum is good in winter and fall summertime is you know for your vodka it's for your light rum it's for white wine and rosé like that's where <laughs> so i have to keep things so separate in my brain first up is going to be a riesling I don't know the right way to pronounce Riesling, as I'm just going to say it like an American. These wines are made from the Riesling grape. Which... I have never liked a Riesling. Part of the reason, I think, is because they're generally sweeter than a lot of the other wines that I've come across. And I'm just like, I don't like them. It was first cultivated in the Rhine region of Germany. Um, I think they've got a reputation for being very sweet. At least that's what I've been told. And it's true that these are quite often very sweet. But there are also dry varieties of Rieslings, um, and they will be very acidic. And that's actually the defining characteristic of a Riesling. Riesling grapes produce a very acidic wine, and the sweet variety of that wine is attempting to balance the acid, where the dry variety is embracing it. So I'm told to look for floral notes, I'm told to look for citrus, lime, peaches, nectarines, herbs. And, and honestly, I feel like just a lot of the times, it does, like, it that balancing act fails like and i know some people really like a riesling um but i just i've, I've never ever liked it um rieslings are typically very herbal so let's give this one a try uh this one happens to be a california riesling and it's called gladiolas 
Here we go, Gladiolus. So this one is pretty sweet, and I like it. I mean, it tastes like apple juice. I don't think this is an insult, but that tastes like the sparkling apple cider that they gave you at New Year's when you were a kid. Riesling, like, okay, look, a sweet Riesling, in my opinion, the only place it has is in a white sangria. <laughs> like, if it's a sweet white, it's going straight into the sangria, man. Like, <laughs> I can't. I just don't. I just don't. Per and then that's, like, a very personal thing, too. I do not like a sweet wine at all, ever. I just am not a fan of sweet whites or sweet reds. I just don't like them. Um... So if it's a sweeter wine, I'm going to use it in sangria instead. Like, like sangria is supposed to be a little sweeter. So it's like that I can mess with. Um, as like, I mean, I, I usually add some kind of like citrusy element to a sangria. Like I'll do, I'll usually do some triple sec. Um, I'll do, I'll cut, if it's a dry red that I'm doing, then I'll add peach schnapps. Uh, peach schnapps can go in a white sangria too, honestly. Um, like I like a little bit of orange juice sometimes, um, especially in a red, um, apple juice, uh, or pineapple juice sometimes, like not a ton of pineapple, like a more, I'm more likely to use a uh, pineapple juice in a red just to like add a little bit of bite. Um, or like when it's a white, uh, I'll use, I've, I've used, um, like apple cider, like, uh, apple cider beer, um, or like hard cider in a, in a white sangria before. And it turned out really, really nice. You can also use like, um, like orange, like a shock top, like a lot of shock top, uh, that brand of beer goes well in like a white sangria, especially again, like you cut a little bit of the sweetness out. It stays sweet and citrusy and light and fruity but it's not like cloying um i mean i usually add a little bit of lemon juice to uh to like a red you know like that's at the end i don't like if i'm making a big vat of sangria that's usually wine peach schnapps sometimes like we've been using cherry juice a lot recently and then like I, you add a little bit of triple sec or lemon juice to the thing itself but like you know just if it's sweet tea too long like explanation there for me to say, if it's sweet, it goes into sangria. Because you couldn't drink. It tastes like sweetened apple juice. I'm not going to get much else out of that. I mean, I get basically sweet, tart, apple -y flavors. Like green apples? Yeah. Um, now I'm looking at Pinot Gris, also known as Pinot Grigio. This is a single variety of grape that is produced in a number of places, but mainly in Italy, France, and Germany. It's a light wine, dry. I think I'm supposed to look for citrus and orange and floral notes and apple skins and apparently cheese rind, which seems like a big old huge left turn to me, but let's see, all right? And those are general tasting profiles for a Pinot Grigio, and that's for all these wines. Um, when you order from Bright Cellars, they all actually come with cards that tell you what to, that wine tastes like. I am intentionally eschewing them here because I'm talking about the class of wines at large and seeing how they kind of compare to what I've been told to expect. It would not, it would color my expectations if I had read those, but I do love those cards. They're really cool. It's one of the best parts about Bright Cellars. Petrochroma, here we go. There you go. That is really tart. Like really, really tart. Not overly tart, just like surprisingly tart. It is tarter than any other wine. Definitely citrusy. Definitely bright. I don't get floral on this one. I also don't get cheese rind. I mean, that which cheese? That's a very specific toasting note. This one is pretty tart and citrusy too, this one that I've got here. That's just light, bright, kind of citrusy, dry. I guess there's no tannins, but it is kind of sucking the water out of your mouth. Yeah, that's good. It's a refreshing, good wine. I like that. It's time for the other Sauvignon. This is Sauvignon Blanc. This is a grape that is mainly grown in France, uh, which should be bitter and citrusy, or so I'm told. Like citrus pith, like grapefruit, like really citrus bitter. I'm also told that it could be minty and herbaceous and like with pungent tropical fruits, like passion fruit. Tart and herby. They seem to be the two most common descriptors of this. So let's see how Quinta Royal stacks up. Glug, glug. Okay, good. It is tart. It is very tart. Oh yeah, I do. That's like lemon. That tastes like lemon. Kind of funky lemons. Maybe that's Meyer lemons. Or like fermenting lemons. Like lemony funk. I've never encountered that before. <laughs> this one has a little evolution on it. So this opens up really tart and sharp in a apple, cherry, orchardy kind of way. And then this weird twist happens where like this 
lemon, lemony, kind of funky, fermenty lemon kind of thing happens. It's lemon, but eh, a little skew. Oh, that's different. I like that. And now finally, Chardonnay. This is a grape that was first cultivated in France and is actually the main grape used in white Burgundy wine. Burgundy being a regional appellation of France and commonly associated with the red wines of that region. But there is a white wine from that region and it's very famous. And the white wine from that region is made with the Chardonnay grape. This one is not a white Burgundy, but it is a Chardonnay. The grape produces a dry and full body wine with a strong lemony note. I'm also told to expect pears and apples. And uh, this is a white that is sometimes aged in oak. And when aged in oak, it will have flavor profiles that include baking spice, butterscotch, and caramel. See, I, when it comes to Chardonnay, I'm incredibly picky. Not like I haven't been incredibly picky this entire time, but like the Chardonnay in particular, I'm just like, if, if there's like even a hint of a buttery note in that Chardonnay, I am out. Like, I cannot. Uh, <laughs> doesn't matter how badly I want to drink. I'm like, but it's buttery. I can't. I can't. Uh, that happened to, like, last Christmas. Well, it's like, we, we brought some wines up to, to the house for Christmas. And, like, we had a box of red, a box of white. Because we needed a lot of it, basically, for the price. And I brought a little bit of whiskey with me as well, like two flasks of whiskey. I think it was these two flasks <laughs> of whiskey. Um, and like, I mean, we finished the red, we finished the whiskey and all was left is the buttery. I'm like, I can't do this. <laughs> like I'm out, I'm done drinking, probably good. There was a lot of us drinking. It wasn't just me and like two people. There was like six of us, but still it was a bummer anyway. I hate a buttery shard. Or so I'm told. Let's see if I can pick out any of that in this Ochavado Chardonnay. And it does have a, it's a white wine with, it's got a little color on it. So maybe this one has been aged. Let's find out. Bright floral citrus tart. Not as dry as the Sauvignon Blanc. It's a little sweeter. I like it. It's more balanced to my palate, honestly. The other one, some of the other ones were like aperitifo kind of uh, citrusy. This is much more balanced. I like that a lot. I don't Much think I'm getting any vanilla or baking. Maybe a little vanilla, maybe, but no, I don't think so. If it's there, it's, it's, it's so subtle, it's questionable, it's hallucinatory. It's still dry enough to be dry. It's not like a sweet wine, but I, it is a little bit sweeter for sure. And I think that that actually helps it a lot. I think that makes, I like this better personally. Anyway, there it is. Those are the wines. Well, this was far from an exhaustive wine list, but I know it was a hugely informative thing for me to put together. Putting it together really helped me a lot, and then trying all these wines, very helpful. Hopefully, it was useful for you too. I do wanna thank Bright Cellars again for sponsoring this one and helping me do this wine learning with you. Why don't you uh, go ahead and click the link in the pinned comment there and pop on over to Bright Cellars. Because right now, Bright Cellars is giving HDD fans an exclusive deal, half off your first six bottle box and a bonus bottle on top of that, so seven bottles. And all you've got to do is click the link below, take the little quiz, and get started. So give that a try. Well, thanks for watching, and I'll be back soon with another episode of HED. And in the meantime, maybe why don't you check out one of these other ones that you may have missed, huh? Why not? Give that a try. Give that a try. Oh, here's an episode. The episodes are appearing around me as if by magic. Magic. No, it happened a long magic time ago, episodes. buddy. Look at them. For you. Uh... All right, see you soon. Bye. Today, Bye. I... <laughs> all right so that was uh how to drink uh the episode about wine um i'm not kidding sellers i'll you can sponsor me i wouldn't be mad about it i would 100 percent drink all your wines on camera forever <laughs> um okay so yeah this one was like we obviously this that promotion is no longer a thing this video aired a year ago. Frustrating. But anyway, um, potentially, I mean, we'll see. We'll see. I've definitely used some of those links before, to, like that uh, from a YouTube video to actually get stuff. Um, you know, 
fun times. I hope you enjoyed learning about wine. Um, I didn't come up with any kind of like drinking game for this, except for like halfway through when he kept staring into my eyes directly as he had those drinks, which was highly uncomfortable. So I decided to do that to you as well. And I hope that you were just as uncomfortable as I was, because <laughs> I'm horrid. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, I hope that you come back next time. If you want to see more specific stuff from How to Drink, let me know. If you want to see more specific stuff involving alcohol, let me know. Um, and if you want to see something else uh, not related to any of those things, you can let me know about that too. That's fine. I just need you to put it in those comments below. Make sure you give this video a thumbs up if you liked it, or even if you didn't, give me a thumbs up out of spite. How about that? I wouldn't be mad about it. Um, and then it would also help us out immensely if you could subscribe to our channel. Um, we're trying to get to 100,000 subscribers. We are getting close. Um, and it would just, you know, it would fill us all with much love and excitement if you would help us with that uh the last way that you could help us out um is you could become a patron if you do that there are some perks in it for you um it's not just us that benefit you would get early content or sometimes content that we can't put on youtube at all um you can uh, participate in polls uh, your suggestions go to the top of the list when it comes to suggestions for what we're supposed to watch all sorts of fun little perks for you um and, if you, and again, if you can't, it just, it would help us out, helping us out by like liking the video, subscribing to the channel. Those are both very helpful as well. We appreciate you all so very much. And I will see you in the next one.